Welcome to the Witty and Gritty podcast. We are in our, our author mini series, and we are so excited to have Michelle here. And if you don't know her yet, you're going to, and she's amazing. Wealth of knowledge. Basically, anything you read of hers, even if it's for kids, you're going to learn. And that's so great. So thank you, Michelle, for coming on the show. Tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Thanks so much for having me. And I am so delighted that you said that because, yes, I thought really hard as a counselor and a family counselor about how to equip parents to help their kids manage their emotions. And because that, if we don't manage them, it's going to lead to my office. It's going to lead to depression and anxiety and symptomology in the body. That's going to cause problems for kids. Number one worry in the country for parents today. And so I thought about this and I thought about all, I don't know about you, you tell me how many parenting books and I love parenting books. Don't get me wrong. I, I will say this. I like to buy parenting books. I love to buy parenting audiobooks. but the research says that if for the average adult nonfiction book, that even barely a small population buys that. And then those who do 80% of them only complete 20% of the content. Those are crazy numbers. They are, but think about your book stacks. Wouldn't you, would you not relate at all to that? I mean, I am a total reader. I'm a total book buyer. I fit in the category I'm trying to reach and I skim it. I'm looking for something in particular, or I started reading this and then this came along and I want, I mean, it's just a weird world we live in today because there's so much available. Like my mom's like one parenting book, you know, and if he, we thought he was dumb, we just didn't pay any attention to it. And I'm like, I don't want to know what you did, mom, but So that's why I decided to write to kids because parents read books with kids and I, and we want things short and sweet. And in the counseling office, a lot of times we meet with a kid for like 30 to 45 minutes. We spend about 10 to 15 with a parent. So I thought about how do I give those kind of chunks to parents and their, and their child. And so we're equipping not only both generations, But we're equipping them to talk to one another, which is what excites me so much. And I see this happening, like with my siblings' kids. My siblings sometimes are like, they have adult kids, and they're like, "Um, you know, it's so hard because they call you, and you can't fix anything at that point. You can't even fix them anymore. You can't even try to fix them anymore. And But they tell them things. And I thought, are they whinier than our generation? No, we just whine to our friends. We never told our parents the stuff that people are, kids are telling them now, which I want to see continue even younger. Like kids are so scared of disappointing their parents. They don't sometimes talk about their their emotions. So they think they're, especially Christian parents, they think they're going to get in trouble for like their kids are going to get in trouble for talking back if they're mad or something like that. And so we do have to teach our kids how to manage their emotions and how to deal with it. But just starting this conversation is so exciting to me. I love that. So again, wealth of knowledge, like I said. So today we are specifically talking about managing your emojis and the tagline is 100 devotions for navigating your feelings. So the cover is kid friendly. It would, it does grab your attention. It's going to grab your kid's attention too. So you've mentioned. And there's a funny story. I will tell you, you want to hear something hysterical? I normally, you don't know. Okay. So my 12 year old, we're ready to go to press. He looks at the cover because he's kind of helped me like, you know, I'll, I'll yell upstairs. Hey, Nolan, how do you say this? And he'll tell me how to say it in the way a kid would say it. So I'm relatable to them. And he looks at the cover and he's like, Mom, um, I thought this was about sad, mad and, and, and scared and happy. And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, um, well, you have, a sa- you have a sad emoji on there. You have a silly emoji on there. And then you have emoji that either means silly or flirty. Do you want to flirt with your readers? And I'm like, no, no. So I quickly went back to the design team at um, our publishing company and said, hey, this is what my son just told me. And they're like, tell him great catch. Our art department did not realize that. And so we changed one of the emojis on the cover to reflect the content better. So there you go. Oh, I, that is a good story. Thanks for the insight. Yeah, story. About that. Yeah. <laughs> Nolan. We're so proud of you. <laughs> so you've mentioned kind of in a nutshell what the book is about, but um, what inspired you to write on this particular topic? What kind of trends have you seen through your counseling life or through parenting? What have you kind of seen to make you go, huh, let's put all this together? 
Well, and this is the follow-up age-wise to another series that um, just released the second in called God I Feel. And GodIFeel.com has God I Feel Sad, God I Feel Scared. The subtitle for that series, different co-author, Tama Fortner with that one, bringing big emotions to a bigger God. And the idea behind all of this, because Lynn Cowell, who's my co-author on emojis, was so great, gracious to like, she's like, this is not my band house. I think I'm not great at this. And I'm like, but you'll be even better by the time we're done writing, you know. So when we started working on this, for me, it was, and I'm going to get emotional as I talk about it, because it's such an emotional moment in the counseling center, when a parent is devastated by a child who's considered taking their own life, doesn't want to go to school, um, no longer wants to interact with their peers. And they're like, where did this come from? It's like out of nowhere. And let me say this, that can happen biologically. For example, I had a child who was an amazing child, never had any symptoms previous. He did not sleep for three nights in a row. He had some pretty crazy thoughts going through his head, very irrational thinking about life and death and things like that, that just came out of the lack of sleep. That's how they torture you know, people in, in, in war is depriving them of sleep. But for the average kid, they're having this emotional struggle. And it usually happens, in the, and I wrote to this age range intentionally, this kind of like second to eighth grader. Because when they're young, in the ages of the preschool books, parents do stuff like, you know, we sing with them, we pray with them, we tuck them in. We do this whole routine. In fact, if we don't do it, they won't stay in their beds. You know, they're popping out and stuff like that. But then when they get in this age range, a lot of times we're in the car, especially if we've got a broad range. Like I've got, I, I'm in this parenting trenches with all of you guys. I've got a, I'm, I'm in the better end of this. Some of you would think not, but I do think. I'm in the 16 and 13 year old. And, and now I've got a 13 year old and a 16 year old. But you know, when we were, when they were, Younger, especially, I mean, we're all exhausted by 10 o'clock, especially me. I'm 53 years old with a 10, 13 year old. I'm exhausted. My mom, we did the math today. I was 30 when she was 53. Like, that's a big difference. Like, so, and that's the research. The research says a lot of us are older. We're older as parents than our parents were. And so we're getting in at like 10, 9, 10 o'clock with these kids. Sometimes we're shoveling food down. And then we're, we're not um, tucking them in through this routine. We're just like, get in bed, get in bed as quick as you can because you got to get them to go to school in the morning and you struggle with that. And so then they get in their rooms and they experience all these thoughts and these emotions and they play back their day. And I think it's a time where either they are going to turn to God and find ways to cope with that or... That is a time, if you believe in a spiritual idea of an enemy, which I do, he's going to come in and make them feel like garbage. And that's going to grow in their lives. It's like a little seed of doubt that becomes this low self-esteem or a little bit of fear that doesn't get treated and they don't know how to cope with that ends up becoming an anxiety disorder. And so what I wanted with this series was really different than what the church has done in general with emotions. The church has said, I hear this all the time. Don't you faith over feelings? Have you ever heard that? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Right. So there's, and I don't disagree with that idea, but we have ignored the feelings. In other words, if we're thinking about a bus, because kids ride a school bus, a lot of them, we have taken the feelings off the bus in the seventies, eighties, nineties, and it didn't work. Mental health has just grown. The church has said, trust God, read your Bible, pray, and you'll be fine. And the reality is you do those things, but you also acknowledge your humanity and the emotions you feel. Brené Brown's research says we're real weak on emotional vocabulary now. So part of the reason I wrote these books was to expand emotional vocabulary starting all the way down at age four. And in the parents' lives, some of us don't have, like, we have mad and really, really mad. I mean, that's great for a three-year-old, but hopefully we have frustrated, disappointed, irritated. We have more vocabulary to explain different degrees. So the goal was to equip families to, to know these words, talk about these things, and to say, I can love Jesus. I can feel these feelings. 
I can tell where they're affecting them in my body because we know this somatic, this biological, neurological part cannot be ignored. And then I can process them, cope with them, release them. And so it's a holistic model of treatment like we use in our counseling center because we use a bio, psycho, social, spiritual model. The church tends to love the spiritual, but Jesus grew in, you know, stature and favor with men. He didn't just grow in one area. And, and, and I think it's so important that we realize that and we help kids as they feel things, they're feeling them in the body. So we help them release them. And so that was my goal was to not, to, to help them know that God wants them to take their scared to them. And he wants to help them in their scared, but they can feel scared. Those scriptures about fear not is not to make us feel guilty when we're scared. They are to reassure us that he's got us because we're going to feel scared. Yep. I love how the book is set up too. It's just it's so nicely done. Number one, you have a bookmark, which I just love. But the way I that- love that too so much. I'm so <laughs> grateful for HarperCollins Christians Honor Kids because that is an extra expense yep. that a lot of publishers won't do. And they put that bookmark in there because they know that kids aren't going to read this every night yep. because that's not realistic, but it is beginning to help them train their brain to learn scripture and read it. And the way your days are set up, or just, it's manageable chunks. Like as a former educator, looking at this, it's manageable. I can do it. It's broken down to where it makes sense for me and how I'm growing. And this is also a cool way to have a diary if you need it. (laughs) That is so true. And that's because what we have to do is get those feelings from the inside on the outside. So we could talk about them. But some of us, like I'm a very external processor. I know you're shocked by the amount of words I've given you so far. But my husband's an internal processor. And so writing makes more sense for him or thinking about something. So that is how we design this. We have a scripture. We have a story or a life application because we all relate to that so well. And then we have kind of like an action, like it it, literally I'm giving you things we might give a kid as a homework assignment or a family as a homework assignment in the counseling office a lot of times. And then we're ending with a prayer because we do want to involve God in this process. Because one of the things I've told my kids since they were very little, because kids are scared of disappointing their parents and they're scared of overwhelming their parents because we're overwhelmed a lot of us today and we show that to our children which is great because we used to hide this from our kids and then they wondered why they were weird or different or struggling but I've always said to them there is nothing you're going to face in life then you and I and God cannot handle together we'll figure it out and I think that's given my kids the confidence to face really hard things I don't know what your family's been through but like Um, My husband's twin sister and her husband died of cancer, leaving behind three kids. Like my kids thought for a while, both parents die. And we had a lot of sad and scared running around our family and some mad. I was mad more so because it was just a lot. It was a lot. Grief has a mad component and it was just a lot. Um, Families go through so many different changes in just, and we're seeing more of this right now, post pandemic, um, moving more financial struggles more, um, somebody being ill in the family more, dealing with death of the grandparents as kids age. And and unfortunately, the divorce, I mean, I work in high conflict divorce and family law. And right now the lawyers are doing very well because we were all stuck together in a home and some of us didn't decide we didn't like each other very well. And that's hard on kids, whether you stay together or you don't. When a, two adults in their home aren't getting along, they have a lot of emotion and our kids are little sponges. They absorb it. Oh, you're so full of information. I love this. I like how you keep saying the research shows. I am a nerd and I love to nerd out. So <laughs> the research, I'm like, yes, give me your articles. Where are you reading these things? I love it. <laughs> so a kid picks up this book. Somehow it gets in their hands. What are some, what are just one or two takeaways that they're going to start noticing or the parents might even start noticing? One of the things we hope they're going to notice is that their feelings may seem really big, but like I used to always say, I've never met, we always talk about like a worry monster. Sometimes we take um, worry and we want to get it outside of ourselves. So, cause I don't want a kid fighting themselves. So a lot of times in the play therapy office, we will talk about worry like a worry dragon. 
boys love this because they like to fight things, you know, and slay things. So, I mean, we've got the armor of God. We'll let them put on the armor of God and they'll go with the sword after their worry dragon. And they'll say things like, I'm not going to let you control me. I know you're here, but so we give, we help them get some powerful words to do that. And we hope that's a message very much when it comes to all of these feelings that it's okay to feel them, but there is a faith over whatever feeling in the sense that it doesn't have to control you. And so that's, I'm really known, I'm getting known for saying this and I'm good with this. And that is this, I want the feelings on the bus, but the feelings don't drive the bus because sometimes our feelings fool us. Sometimes our feelings make, like, I'll give you a great example. Um, so I, you know, I have these adolescents, right? So the other, like a couple years ago, I had one of them in the car and I'm like picking them up and then we're supposed to go to Taco Bell and then we're supposed to go to a soccer field, Right. And I don't have time because grandma has had an emergency. And so my husband's running. He was on the soccer field to go take grandma to the hospital. And these are real things parents in my age range are, they're dealing with the gap between raising their kids and managing their parents' health a lot of times or helping them with that. So he's on the way to the hospital to get grandma, take her to the hospital. Um, And so I'm telling this kid, like, we're not going to talk about we'll get something at home. And you would have thought I said grandma died. Because this child's reaction is like, I mean, this is a child who eats three meals a day plus, you know, so I can't make it there. I can't make it to the soccer field at home. I need to go through a drive through And I just looked at this kid and I said to them, and this is a great tool to use in this age range, this, this range, range that emojis is for. You got to shrink the numbers for the younger ages. But on a scale of one to 10, how significant in your life is it that we're not going to talk about right now? And I love the answer I got. It feels like an eight, but I know it's a two. Like, you know, don't we feel that way, right? Like, it feels like this. This is perspective. This is something that all of us struggle with at times. Because if we have an expectation, and nobody can see me, but I've got my hand up high, like a high expectation. And then our reality hits below that expectation, the bigger the gap more intense the feeling is so you know yes she acted like I'd said grandma's dying and we've got to run to the hospital instead of we can't go to Taco Bell and we all have those moments you know with preschoolers it's like they're so much easier because you can say to them like they're like I want ice cream I want ice cream you're not getting ice cream today I know you want ice cream but you're not getting ice cream but I want ice cream and they're starting to melt down I want and you're like I mean I used to do this all the time to my little preschoolers Oh my gosh, there's a bird right there. Look at that bird. Oh, it's so pretty. Do you see the red bird? And they're like, look at the bird. Look at that bird. It's They're totally forgotten about ice cream because they're looking at the bird, right? But you can't use that on a 10-year-old. You can't go while they're crying about Taco Bell. Look at the bird. They'll just be like, I want Taco Bell. You know, <laughs> they don't care as much. So what we tried to do here is to help them think about the intensity of their emotions and how much they want their emotions to drive the bus. Because we have a lot of kids, and this is why I believe the statistics are increasing so much. And a lot of these are on the National Institute of Mental Health. That's one of the places you can look for some of this research, is that if you let your feelings dictate your life, it's, first of all, that's very unbiblical because the Bible says be renewed by your mind and things like that. And I talk about that in a women's book called Make Up Your Mind, this idea that our mindset is to dictate our feelings. But we can't just say, I don't feel angry because I know that, you know, I'm to be, uh, let's see, quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. We have to say, I'm struggling with this. I'm feeling anger in my body. And then maybe even being curious. This is one of the tools we teach in emojis. Let's be curious. Where does that anger come from? What's that anger about? Do I want to keep the anger? If I don't want to keep the anger, how could I change that? What could I do differently? What could I think differently? I love that. So many great tools. Everyone go add this to your car right now, along with all her other books. Michelle, what is something that you want to say to drive a point home? Something we didn't set you up for that you want to say? What is your final encouragement to these listeners today? I would say for all of us, sometimes when we're struggling, I know even for me, because sometimes it makes me feel more because I recognize the feelings in my body more. We want to turn away from God in those moments. 
And I think it's important we learn how to turn towards God and we help our kids do that because, and this is where I would leave the parents because I know many parents are listening to this and I have a podcast called Raising Mentally Healthy Kids. And my first show is Mentally Healthy Parents Raise Mentally Healthy Kids. I can't tell you the number of times I've got a kid in the office because parents will spend money on their kids for therapy. But that parent, that kid's anxiety, they're learning that behavior. And from a parent who has struggled with anxiety and won't slow down to get their own taken care of because of trauma in their past, because of stress in their current life, because of life is hard. Life is hard. And I think we all need help and we need to find it somewhere. So I think mentally healthy parents raise mentally healthy kids. And that means that all of us are going to have those moments. And it's really important that we involve God in that process because he brings a power and a hope that we can't have on our own. This is not a self-help book. We don't, I don't think we need another one of those because none of us can do it well on our own. We need God in the form of human vessels and we need God in the sense of his spirit and through his word to make changes. And that's why we created this book to retrain the brain, to help kids retrain the brain through learning God's word. And you're right. It was really hard for me. I am not a person of few words. I'm a reading specialist from my early days in education with kids. And all of these passages are 300 words or less intentionally. We know we have dyslexic readers. Some of them are written on a very low reading level. In fact, One of the biggest gifts anyone gave me is a friend of mine who has a dyslexic child who has never read an entire book. It wasn't this book. It was our previous book, Loved and Cherished, was the first book. All her friends would be like, did you read this? I read this. And she'd never been able to say, I read this. And she was able to say, I read this book. And that, as a previous reading specialist, brings so much joy to my heart to think that in a day where kids pick YouTube, which they learn, I mean, my son learned great science off of that, that they're also maybe gaining confidence in their ability to read as they're also gaining skills and their ability to cope when hard times come. Oh, I love that. That's part of Farron's mission with her dyslexia stuff too. Wow, look at you guys, you reading specialists. I'm so proud of y'all. Well, Michelle, thank you for coming on the show today. Where can people find you on the, the World Wide Web? How do we find more of you? <laughs> Well, you can find me in a lot of different places. If you put my name in your podcast app, I do a lot of podcasts like this. And I love to do a shout out to that because I want people to find me as a guest on different podcasts. Um, You can also find me at yourmentalhealthcoach.com. I love to interact with people on Instagram. I would love to offer you a free resource. If you want to check out like seven passages of this book, if you go to my website, yourmentalhealthcoach.com, you can sign up to receive seven pages from there, and they're different than the ones we put. All these books have resources on the Bible app, and they're different, so you get to see a little bit more. And these also have audio versions that go with them, and I love the the children's book series, the smaller kids' book series, the God I Feel series. They've allowed me, because, you know, how long do you read a book that that's big on an audio book? But people have Audible credits, and they want to use them. If they're like me, I just looked today, I have 16 left. <laughs> But I'm going through them pretty fast. Yeah. So um, I did a parent talk on how to talk to your kids about sad and scared, how to equip your kids to manage sad and squared. So there's more to it than just the book itself. So there's lots of places you can find me. And I love to interact with families. I also have a Facebook group called Raising Mentally Healthy Kids. And you can get in there. I'm not in there as often as I want right now because I have been in a huge season of writing and and, and I still have one more book to get done, but I do plan to interact there more once that last book is finished. And you have an Instagram handle too. What is it? It is. It's just Michelle Neter everywhere you go. And, and Neter is N I E T E R T. And you may have to look, I married a great man, but boy, that name kills me. And she's like, if you go to your mental health coach.com, then you can find it there. And if you do need help, I do offer parent consults um, for parents across the country. If they've got some questions about their kids, mental health. Um, I also have a, we have a nonprofit called hope help stop me and our counseling staff see clients through telehealth all over the country as well. Good. And listeners, you know, I'm the queen of links. I'm going to link everything. So wherever you're (laughs) listening to this scroll down and you can, 
click any of the links there or you can click for full show notes and then I'll also have it there with a blog post about this episode. Michelle, you're amazing. Thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. I really do hope this encourages someone who's listening today, not only to check out the book, but just uh, they're struggling with an emotion to to find some help, whether it's in God's word or through a, a Christian resource or um, through a Christian counselor or their pastor. Love it. Okay, thanks. And hopefully we'll have you on again in the future. Sounds great.